Welcome to the Uproar Live YouTube page. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe. This is your way to stay tuned with any encouragement that we are sending out every single week. So take a moment and click the subscribe button now. Now, if you are also looking for a word that is bound to feel like God is speaking to you himself, bound to make you feel like you are not alone through your circumstances and what you were going through, this is going to be the message for you. And we don't want you to keep it to yourself. So be sure to share it with a friend, a family member, a coworker, or whoever you know. And if you want to give and connect with the ministry, we encourage you to do so in that moment by using one of the various methods that you see on your screen. Or if you would like more information, you can click the description. Now, let's get to this word. If you've been with us for a while, you've heard me tell plenty of stories about the early years of uproar and the grind and the, the struggle of starting a church from scratch. I mean, literally from scratch. And starting a church from scratch is tough. Most churches that you see boom overnight, it's usually because, it's not always because of the anointing. Sometimes it's just because of advertising dollars. You know, a lot of ministries get planted and have hundreds of thousands of dollars a year dedicated to their ministry. For the first five years, they have multiple salaries and staff member salaries and health benefits covered. The pastor gets a house, health care, all that kind of stuff. The musicians are all paid. And this is what happens when a church is planted. Whoever plants them sends them about 20 volunteers for the first year. They don't have to discover volunteers or pray for volunteers. They, they start off with 20 or 30 volunteers. And I must say, I, I used to be kind of jealous. But as you live a little bit, you start to see that a lot of those ministries that start off that way don't finish strong. There, there's something about the grind of growing something from scratch. There's something about seeing God's hand in the good times and God's hand in the bad times. I also think that when you start off easy, you forfeit the wisdom that is needed and the grit that is needed to sustain. You, you learn you have to be nice to people because everybody coming in, you need. <laughs> you don't get entitled with people because you've always had people. I really think in those early years of starting a church, it is crucial for a pastor to start with nothing because it really teaches you how to love people and lead people. But it is tough. It is tough. I mean, we would be doing outreaches and giving away every dollar. I, I was bivocational in the early years, so I was putting half of my paycheck into the offering plate. I was a union electrician. I went to school, got my master's, all of that kind of stuff just to quit, you know, at 26 and go into ministry full time in faith. But we were going into the communities, these turkey giveaways that many of you give towards and have given towards today. We were doing these in year one. And I was using my own money, my own paychecks to go out and set up these tables. Modesty and her brother will tell you in the back, we were setting them up with their family and it was just a few of us and we were making sure every family in Brooklyn homes was eating. And we've been doing that for 15 years. And thanks to many of you all, yes, here and online, you have allowed us to go from Brooklyn homes to Cherry Hill, to Westport, to Latrobe, to Poe Homes, I mean, Gilmore Homes. I mean, I could keep naming the names of communities that we are going to be taking turkeys into. And not just turkeys, we help all through the week with needs of family members in these communities. Many will say, why do you guys always go to the city? Well, it's because I want to help people that can't pay us back. A lot of churches don't do outreach because they do outreach and the people don't come to their church that Sunday. We go into the city so that we don't expect people to come to church on Sunday. We are doing, I believe, Jesus ministry. We are not doing it for them to come to us. We are going to them. Yeah. That, that's how Jesus rolled. 
But what many don't know is that while I was starting the church almost to like 30, which was like a year ago, um, you know, you're not supposed to laugh at that. You're supposed to be real quiet at that moment like you agree, of course. But what many don't know is that while we were doing these outreaches and while I was growing the church from scratch, I lived in Brooklyn Homes. I lived in Brooklyn Homes till I was around 30 years old. I was living like right in front of my uh, house. Somebody was shot and murdered. And I would go to church the next day and pastor. You get a, when you learn about a person, you understand why God calls them and why they do what they do and how they tick. So I lived in this house uh, behind me till I was about 30. I lived on the top floor because many homes in the city are two levels. I had an older couple underneath of me and, and I lived upstairs. And this was not new to me because the house that my mother had me in, the house I was raised in, was right down the street. And guess what? Throughout my childhood, we lived on the top floor of, of that apartment. So I know all too well about being poor. I watched my mom navigate and throw meals together and buy dented cans at the store down the street just to save a little bit of money. There were nights we just ate green beans and we put some season all on it because we, we were poor. To this day, I can't eat green beans from a can without getting sick. True story. I can't do it. I have to eat fresh ones because I ate them my whole childhood. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. And my mom would sometimes make oodles and noodles when we were really trying to be fancy. But I know what it's like to, to come from the other side of the tracks. That's why when I look at my life, I'm so grateful for the opportunities that God has given me. Because just 10 years ago, I was walking to the corner store to cash my check. God has a way of blowing your mind. But while juggling the church, and eventually, because I was feeding families, Modesty and Jalen remember this, I was feeding their family in particular every single week, paying their rent every single month. I got evicted out of my place and had to, at 30, go sleep back on my mom's couch. Imagine having to preach faith and you're a 30-year-old man sleeping on your mom's couch. I got evicted, and we took the church van we had at the time, and her and her family moved all of my stuff out, and the big furniture, we, we just left it. Because it was a grind, it was a struggle. And I remember having to pay my bills and pay the church's bills, and every single month, there were multiple turnoff notices. Now, I'm thankful my mother taught me as a child how to navigate the turn-off notices. Yes. Yes. That's the benefit of coming up that way. I can navigate some stuff. And, you know, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's knowing what can get put off 30 days before it messes up your credit. You learn all of those tricks. Oh, I still got a week. But I remember the turn-off notices, BGE, the, the rent. It was all of these uh, church insurances and things I wasn't prepared for, accounting fees for the accountant we had. It was all of these things that were coming in, and I just did not have it. And I knew the Lord called me to quit my job because I was taken off like every week for funerals and every week to go to the hospital and all, all of the demands. I was counseling everybody. I, I couldn't juggle it all. I had somebody a few years back say, what all do you really do during the week? I said, really? This is the easiest part of my week. But I just remember I was taken off all the time. My bosses were getting frustrated with me. And they, 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 they were favoring me and they were still paying me for 40 hours a week, even though I was working 24 hours a week. It was unheard of. And I shared the story often how when I finally quit, the owner was like, are you sure? Are you sure? And, and I was shocked that he was almost like fighting me about quitting because I was taking off so much. And I wasn't like the best electrician. But he said to me, he said, I, I'm not a godly man, 
But I know this, if God is real, he said, my mom raised me in church. He said, if, if God is real, I know that God would shut my business down if I fired you. And I was just a construction worker. But they would see me praying every day. When it was my chance to have the radio, I'm listening to 95.1. And I remember guys would kick my radio and I had to buy a few of them because they would literally break it on the construction site because here I am listening to Christian music and construction workers did not like Christian music. But when it was my time of the day, I was unashamed of the gospel. I said, for me to live is Christ and to die is a game. But I, I, I remember when I quit, I knew it was God. I felt it. <sighs> but then all the bills were coming. And I didn't know how I was going to do it, but somehow, it's like the scripture says, having obtained help from the Lord, I continue on to this day. See, there's something about walking with God when you look back. You don't even know how he did it. You, and you're kind of shocked at how did I survive? How did I pull that off? How did he make a way out of nowhere? I don't know why I still got my house. I don't know how I still got my car. I don't know how I got these kids through school. Is there anybody that has a story kind of like that? When you look back, it's kind of like head scratching. It makes you step back. And if you're really in tune with God, you have to raise your hands. You have to worship because you know that if it was not for him... So we have turned off notices to the point where it, I just kind of just treated them like trash and threw them away because <laughs> I couldn't do nothing about it. My credit was falling apart. I was trying to hold it all together. How many have ever had to be in a place where you were just trying to hold it all Good. together? And the turn off notices were coming and, and coming and coming. And, and here's the thing about a notice. A notice is not an actual shutoff or eviction. It's, it's a notice. It's, it's there to give you time to get it in order. It's, it's just a notice. It's just a wake-up call letting you know that if we don't hear from you, if, if you don't make this payment, if, if you don't set up something on this date, the power's off. On this date, the eviction's coming. On this date, we're towing your car away. On, on, on this date, we're, 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 we're garnishing your wages. It's just saying, on this date, something bad is going to happen. I say all that to say that God has a way of sending us turn-off notices. It's, it's just a notice. And sometimes he does it through different means and different ways, but it's, it's just a notice. Maybe the love is leaving the marriage. It's, 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 it's not the end, but it is a notice. Maybe the doctor finds something that freaks you out. It's not supposed to be the end, but it is. A, a notice. Maybe you see the kids drifting and going in a different direction and God is saying, I'm, I'm not going to let them go too far, but this is a notice. As King Saul, he, he didn't do things God's way. God gave him warning after warning and what did God do? He raised up David. As Tara, somebody says, who's Tara? That's what happens when God moves on from you. <laughs> Terah was Abraham's family, and Terah was supposed to be his uncle. He was supposed to be the one to step into the promised land and be the father of faith. But because he stopped going where God told him to go to Canaan, and he settled down, God had to raise up Abraham. God had to move on from Judas and raise up Matthias, he, he, he had to move on from Elijah. He kept giving them notice after notice in the cave. Wind, fire, you know, all of these things happening all around him. And Elijah was so content with suicide. He was so content and determined to call it quits that God said, okay, I've raised up Elisha. I can't get to you. So I got to move on 
from you. They missed the notices. Solomon built the temple and said, Lord, what happens if famine hits us? What happens if everything goes wrong? God, it will be bad if we build this big old temple and a bad season comes. And God says, Solomon, don't, don't worry about a bad season. He says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. I'll turn from their wicked way and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, heal their land. He says, in other words, if my people catch the notice, I'll turn the situation around. I wonder today how many have gotten a notice and you just threw it in the trash can. Or for some, how many have experienced what was once unnoticed catch up to you? And now you are freaking out. God has a way of sending us notices when a few things are off track. One of which is our faith. When we start getting off track with our faith... Making faith moves. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Making faith moves, yes. But also our, our faith. When we get comfortable with it. When I told somebody the other day, they said, man, I, I'm just tired of waiting on God. It's been forever. When's this coming? When's that happening? I said, do you believe in reaping and sowing? They said, absolutely. Absolutely. I said, well, it could be the God. And I said, this is true. And this ain't meant to make nobody uncomfortable. I said, I said, if it's all about reaping and sowing and you agree, I said, maybe God's making you wait because every Sunday he has to wait till 1020 to see you. I told you, I didn't mean that, that. But if we make God wait, isn't it right for God to make us wait? It's when we get comfortable with our faith. I've been saved for almost 20 years now. I can tell you, there's a reason you'll never see me sit on the side with my leg. I see pastors doing that all the time. No, no, no. I, I, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm still not comfortable. I'm still on the edge because I know there's somebody in here that doesn't have Jesus. I know there's a marriage in here that's ready to call it quits. I know there's somebody in here wrestling with a sickness and you don't know what to do and you don't know where to turn. I know there's somebody in here who is concerned and scared to death about their child. I know there's somebody in here that has bills that are piling up and they don't know where they're going to get help from. How can I get comfortable when I know you need a word? How can I get comfortable when I know you need some power? How can I get comfortable when I know you need some encouragement? Look at somebody and say, don't get comfortable. 20 years and I still don't get comfortable with my faith. I'm still looking for ways to give God, as the C.C. Winans song says, more and more and more and more. Every year, I push myself to give God more in every area of my life. So my faith, my finances, they're big to me. I've been tithing since I got saved. At 19, my mother didn't teach me to tithe. My mother didn't start tithing until she came to my church. She took me to church growing up, and she would give 2 or $3 every week. But maybe that's why we lived the way we lived. There's a reason God pulled me out. And now she's pulled out. <laughs> but it's my, my finances... I got saved at 19. I wish I could tell you it was always great. No, my car got repossessed twice. And I never saw the day when they were towing my car down the street the first time. And the second time, I thought somebody stole it. I called 911. They looked it up. <laughs> Somebody's been there. Y'all laughed a little too hard. I never dreamed that when they were repossessing my car that one day somebody would give me a brand new car. 
after church drop the keys in my hand and say, I don't know what it was. I got a few of these suckers and somebody told me to give this Hummer to you. I never saw that. I never saw when I was getting moved out of that house that God would put me in a better house one day that is completely different than that place. And God doesn't need a whole lot of time. That was just about 10 years ago. I'm, I'm like George and Sweet, you know, I'm like the Jefferson. I, I moved on up. In just 10 years. But I've always kept God first in my finances. I've always been a tither. What is a tithe? It is 10% of what God gives me before taxes. Why before taxes? Because the government takes their cut. Why should God get what's left over? If he is my provider, they're not my provider. Go ask the White House for your rent payment. Yeah, they're going to do that right there. So I've kept God first. Because where your treasure is is where your heart is. I kept God first in my finances. You don't have to clap for me. But that's my walk. You can always preach what you do. I've kept God first with my family. God looks for your relationship with your family. Nothing should be more important than your family. God looks at that. God doesn't just look at your family. He looks at your focus. What are you focused on? Paul said, this one thing I do. David said, one thing do I seek after. Where is your focus? Because you'll never get anything done if you're not focused. Or if your focus is on the wrong thing. And lastly, my future, my vision. When God sees that my future is not headed in the right direction. Because he has me here for a purpose. When he sees that my life is not heading in the right direction. He'll send me a notice. We said Wednesday night for midweek service when we took our pause, we said that God has created us for a purpose. We're, we're doing lessons from the Garden of Eden on Wednesday nights. And we talked about how God has created us for purpose. And I was sharing how before God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, God took the first five days to get everything in order for them. God stepped into the chaos of the world and began to prepare it for Adam and Eve. And I said how God prepares everything before we ever step on the scene. But he doesn't just prepare it for us. He prepares us for it. And there is a purpose. And God is consumed with us reaching our purpose. He said, I know in Jeremiah 29, 11, the plans I have for you. God has plans for you. And what's scary is often when we get into the garden of Gethsemane is where we blow it because often our plans and God's plans collide and God wants to know whose plans are going to win. Because God says, I have plans for you. Your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. God says, I have plans for you. Do you know what God's plans are for you? Because until you fall in line with God's plans for your life, you, you cannot walk in the prosperity that he has for you, the expected end, Jeremiah says, that he has for you. Because all of the provision is tied to his plans. We've been dealing with Esther and God's plans for her life, the plans that God had for her life. We talked about her tragic upbringing and how it almost looked like God didn't have plans for her life. I mean, wouldn't you feel that way if your mother and father died? Wouldn't you feel that way if you had to be raised by your older cousin? 
Wouldn't you feel that way if you didn't have, as a little girl, a mother to teach you how to be a little girl, a mother to teach you how to be a woman? You know, when you had your first moment as a teenager in school, you didn't have nobody to talk to, and you had to hope your uncle could explain it to you? That's a rough spot to be. That make you question some stuff. Or if you were a little boy that didn't have a father to give you attention, a father to teach you how to be a man, how to be a husband, how to do guy stuff. It's hard to be something amazing when you've never had a model. And I like to give people credit because I believe most people are trying their best. But how can you really be the, the best when you've never seen it modeled and you've never had a manual? Esther lost her family, and I said, uncle, I meant her cousin, Mordecai, had to raise her. And she missed out on her childhood. She missed out on memories. But I can tell you from experience, often God allows great people to have tough beginnings so that when you get to where he's taking you, you always remember where you came from. Esther had a hard life. And it says that when the time came, see what had happened was that the queen's wife got out of order. Go back and listen to the last few weeks. I'm not going to preach that all over. But she, she did something so jacked up the king had to move on and replace her. And who would have thought that while Esther is over here struggling, God is removing people on this side that have taken the notice lightly. God is, is making a, a shift in the palace. I said, always remember when you can't trace God or track God, it doesn't mean that God is not moving in high places for you. So he has moved for Esther. He has taken a girl who really didn't even know how to be a girl, how to be a woman as far as carrying herself right. And he has made her queen of the nation. Look at how God will put you in a place that most would say you don't even belong. How are you a queen and you never had a mother? How are you a queen and you never saw somebody model being a wife? How are you a queen and nobody taught you how to be a classy woman? But when God has a purpose for your life, it doesn't matter how you started. It doesn't matter what you didn't have. It doesn't matter where you didn't go to school or where you even did go to school. When God has a plan for your life his plan will come to pass so stop looking at your life stop looking at your past stop looking at your mistakes and just say Lord if you want to use me use me as flawed as I am as broken as I am as jacked up as I am God says if, if you if you just allow him to use you it doesn't matter how you start but he sure can give you a good finish. So it says that the king called her. And I said in verse 15 of, of chapter 2 last week how, how it, it reminds us of everything she, she went through. It reminds us that she lost her, her mother and, and lost her father. Because God wants us to know that all of that is the recipe that got her in the room. And the king fell in love with Esther and put the crown on her head. She was the only one that went before the king as, as herself. She didn't put makeup on. She didn't try to dress like the rest of them. She didn't have jewelry on. She, she, she just said, if, if, if he's going to want me, he has to love me for who I am, not who, I'm, not who the others are pretending to be. And she got in the palace. And her whole life changed. It's the end of problems, right? I heard it said like this. God's gift to you when you get to the next level is a new battle. The battle is an indicator that you have arrived. 
You never stop fighting. It's just that once you fight the lion and then you fight the bear, the Goliaths get a little bit easier and easier because your trust in God gets bigger and bigger. I was wrestling with turnoff notices back in Glen Burnie, and I think our building was around $2,000 a month, electric around $1,000 a month, outreach probably about $2,000 a month, give or take. $10,000 covered everything in Glen Burnie, and the turnoff notices were flying in. Now, I need the Lord to send at least just to uphold our bills, our partnerships, our outreaches, I need the Lord to send at least $50,000 a month. Yes, it takes about a million dollars a year to run this ministry. Owings Mills real estate is not cheap. <laughs> but why is it easier? Because of all the steps along the way I've seen God provide. So when you skip a step, you could cause yourself to have a heart attack at the next level. The trying of your faith, the Bible says, is building patience. So whenever you skip a step, it could be that skip step that causes you to have a heart attack in a new battle. So anyway, Esther's in the palace. You would think the days of struggle are over. But right up under her nose, there's a problem brewing. It says in Esther chapter 3 that this guy, Haman, whenever I say his name, I like to say it like this. Hey, man. <laughs> He's just one of them people. And he comes in, and this dude hates the Jewish People. I'm going to talk more about it next week. Why? But long story short, the reason God replaced Saul is tied to him, even though it's years and years later when he didn't follow God's order and kill all the Amalekites. The descendants lived on and Haman is one of the descendants. He is mad at the Jewish people because of what Saul did to all of his people. Saul killed the whole nation except a few. And if he would have killed those few too, we wouldn't have a Haman in Esther chapter 3. But Haman wants all of the power, but he wants the recognition. He feels so entitled. And the king has given him the royal ring. So, so he is the prime minister of all of Babylon. And he's riding through one, one day, and everybody's bowing down, except for Mordecai, her cousin. He stands up, and Haman is so angry, he strikes him. And when this is over, Haman just cannot shake it. He says, because of Mordecai, because of what one person did, I want to kill the whole group of people. Because of one person's action, I am going to judge and put this one person's action on this whole group. It's always dangerous when you allow one bad apple to define a whole group. It's like when people say, all cops are bad. Eh, We've got some good cops to work here. All cops aren't bad, but a few bad apples. And so on and so on and so on in different groups of people. So he's so angry that he wants to kill all the Jews. All because of Mordecai and all because of what happened yesterday. So he makes this decree. And he gets the king to sign off on it. And Mordecai catches wind of this. But here's the problem. Mordecai is in the trenches grinding, keeping his ear open to what's going on in the streets. And Esther has gotten comfortable in the palace. The struggle is over for Esther. Esther. She's got people dropping flowers when she walks in front of them. 
or when they walk in front of her. She has the best perfumes now. She probably sleeps in silk sheets from Cairo, Egypt. Esther's life has made it. She, she doesn't live in Susa no more. She, she, she's not living in the hood any longer. That's what Susa was. It was where the poor people live. She, she's not living where the poor people live. It's probably been, you know, ages since she's ever even seen a turnoff notice. Esther has arrived. Esther has made it. When you look at Esther now, you couldn't even tell where she came from. And part of that is good because you don't want to look like where God brought you from. But people should be able to tell where God brought you from by what you care about and what you give your time to. Esther is doing neither. They are not getting her time in Susa. And she doesn't even look like she ever came from Susa. Esther has done such a good job at faking who she is that they can't even tell in the palace that she's Jewish. She's talking like them now. Praying like them now. Thinking like them now. Esther has come so far and she has gotten comfortable. She has gotten so comfortable that when she heard her cousin Mordecai ripped his clothes because that's what they would do in biblical days when bad news would come. They would rip their garments and put ashes upon themselves and cry in the streets. When Esther heard that Mordecai did this, she wasn't moved to do nothing. She said, please take my cousin Mordecai a coat and cover him. In other words, tell my cousin to stop making me look bad. That's what she's saying. And she says to Mordecai when he sends word back, she says, understand, nobody for the next 30 days can go before the king. If anybody tries to go before the king, there's one law, and that is that they die. Surely God does not want me to put my life on the line. Surely God understands that this is dangerous and there's nothing I can do about it. I know that God gets it. Please, Mordecai, I need you to get it. And I told you, Esther has gotten comfortable. I wonder... Is there anybody here, anybody watching online, that since the time you got saved in your life, in your faith, with your finances, with your family, with your focus, with your future, I wonder if there's anybody here that has just gotten comfortable. Comfortable. I'm too busy. I don't got enough of this. I don't got enough of that. There's somebody right now saying, I hope he's done soon. That Bengals Ravens game starts at 105 and pre-show starts at 1245. There's somebody here that's comfortable. And God can't send a revival into your life because his revivals don't fit your time frames. And when we get comfortable, we forfeit the right to be used. I can't tell you because I've gotten a chance to pastor uh, different Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Matt Judon, before he left, was a, a very faithful member of our church. He came to all of our outreaches. Uh, I would have dinner and counsel him and his wife. I mean, we, we were super close. Buck Allen. I mean, I could go on and on about the different players that I've gotten a chance to build relationships with uh, that, that have been amazing to our church still are amazing to our church, but they're not in Baltimore no more. 
God has opened up doors where people have called me to go to the Raven Stadium, and I couldn't do it because I'm here with you guys, but to, to be a chaplain for different football teams that are visiting. I've gotten so many opportunities, and who would have thought a kid from the housing projects would get to do that kind of stuff? But I can't tell you how many times people have given me tickets and service ran over. And I had every plan, because one o'clock games, we have a whole plan when I get to go. They drop me off at the front of the stadium, and I get my own way home. But they drop me off right at the front. I'm able to get there so I can listen to the national anthem and do my, oh, I'm from Baltimore. That's, that's big in Baltimore. You got to be there for the national anthem to do the, oh, and the flag was still there. See, y'all are from Baltimore. But the reason I was late is not because I'm not a huge Ravens fan. I got my Roquan number zero jersey. I wear it all the games. But my purpose comes first. Nothing comes before souls. Nothing. Oh, wait, what did Paul say? For me to live is Christ? And to die is a, a gain. It's all about the souls. When service is done, there's one question. We're going to have a runner like Paul Revere running around the building. And they're going to go all through every ministry and talk about one thing, how many souls got saved today. I've said it before, not one person in this church is getting a paycheck, including the guy on the stage. So why do we do it? Why do they practice relentlessly to get on the same page? Why are people making these graphics and putting up lights and putting up TVs and cleaning this building and working with the kids and serving in the parking lot? Nobody's getting paid. The AV people, the camera people, nobody's getting paid. Why are we doing it? We're doing it because souls matter to us. That's what it's all about. God gets us to get others. One of the reasons my job was so afraid to lay me off is because there wasn't one day on a construction site I wasn't leading somebody to Jesus. When I worked at Northwest Hospital for on and off a couple of years doing maintenance stuff for them when they would hire my company, there was not one day I was at the hospital that the doctors that all knew me and the nurses were not taking me in construction clothes to hospice to pray for people. When I was a youth pastor, all the doctors would be doing surgeries and ask me to pray for them. Nurses would be stepping into electrical rooms for prayer. Because when people see that you're real, that is job security. Because until God is ready for you to move on, it doesn't matter what Nebuchadnezzar thinks Daniel would tell you. They can try to get rid of you. They can try to replace you. But kings will go. Bosses will go. Supervisors will come. Supervisors will go. Managers will come. Managers will go. But until God is done with you somewhere, you cannot go nowhere. That's why I don't get discouraged when things go wrong. I know that if it wasn't this, it's because God has a that. If it wasn't was it you? It's because God has somebody else. I've learned to never cry and never get depressed when things go wrong because when one door closes, another door is about to open. There is somebody listening that's getting ready to walk into a door. Somebody left you. Something went wrong. The doctors discovered something, but God sent me to tell you today, a door is getting ready to open. A door for love. A door for a relationship a door for healing, a door for an opportunity, a door for your marriage, a door for your family. Who am I talking to? Can you feel that a door is getting ready to open? Say, open it up, Jesus. So I've learned that when one thing goes wrong, God is always on the move not getting comfortable and let God use you. I know you're not in the will of God if you can't tell me the last stranger you prayed for. The last person you told about Jesus. The last person you invited to church. How are we not inviting people to church? My churches were extreme Pentecostals. I did my part. They were just, some of them were so weird people didn't stay. You know that moment where you start sweating? 
when Sister Betty starts speaking in tongues and dancing, you know, and Brother Rodney starts running around the building, you know, I'm going to have to explain this after church. I did my part. Maybe the church wasn't thinking about them to keep them. But I did my part by bringing them. I still look for people to invite. That's why on Saturdays, everybody here wears their Uproar t-shirts. The Ravens have Purple Friday. We have Uproar Saturday. We wear our t-shirts and go everywhere. And anybody that locks eyes with us, we invite them to church. Because if we believe that we got something good, why are we keeping it from the world that is dying? Say, don't get comfortable. Esther has gotten comfortable. She don't have to struggle. She don't have to grind no more. And so she tells her uncle, I can't do this. It's too risky to do what God is telling me to do. Okay, let's break it down. Tithing is too risky. Serving is too risky. Putting my family first. You know, my boss and my job may say it's too risky. Getting focused on one thing, it's risky. Building my whole life around my vision, it's risky. But you cannot walk by faith and never take risk. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that I'm good. You can't see it till you try it. So Esther says, I, I can't do it. You're going to have to find another way, Mordecai. I can't do it. Yeah, tell him that. That's, that'll suffice. And Mordecai hears it. And he says, oh, no. Oh, no. See, what I forgot to tell you is not only was Haman getting ready to kill and exterminate all the Jewish people, but he had built these gallows. It says in Esther chapter five, he had built these gallows 50 feet high. Not only was Haman toxic, but he, he had a toxic enabling wife too. Because she was actually, you know, he's kind of like, yeah, I want to do something. I want to do something to them work. I don't know. She's like, build gallows. And then he had some friends that were like, make them 50 feet high. And they got this plan. And not only are the Jewish people going to be killed, but the plan is to hang Mordecai high. And while Esther is living in the palace, she doesn't realize that the only little bit of family she has is getting ready to be taken from her. She's already lost her mother and her father. And look at what being comfortable is getting ready to cost her. So Mordecai says, oh no, girl. See, you need somebody that will come back at you with the truth. We like people that comfort us, but you need some people in your life that, that come back at you with the truth. I've got some people in my life that always come back at me with the truth. They, they may feed into me a little bit. Oh, no. How could they do that? The nerve. Oh, please. Yeah, I got some people like that. But then those people turn it around and say, okay, well, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to get your head out of the gutter. God has been good to you. I got people in my life that talk to me like that too. That's the only reason I'm not still living in the projects. What's the difference between when I was there and now? The right person came into my life. And they built me up. And they taught me how to think on another level, how to talk on another level, how to preach on another level. They listened to my sermons and they challenged me and said I could do better in that area. I could have studied a little bit harder on that topic. And they, they told me to throw that stuff out. Take that message down. You could have did that better. When God puts the right people in your life, they start exposing you to people that are on another level. Everybody needs a Mordecai. 
He says, Esther, do you think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? Do, do you think if this thing goes down, you're going to be the only one that's cool? And side note, you never state the obvious. Look at how her cousin is talking to her. She has gotten in the place where she doesn't even care about the well-being of anybody but Esther. She is, she's saying to herself, well, if that happens to you all, favor ain't fair. <laughs> That's literally her mindset. And Mordecai is saying, for if you remain silent at this time, at this time, if you remain silent, Esther, I said earlier, your silence says a lot. If you really want to teach somebody a lesson, just shut up and go quiet. My silence will cut you more than my words. He says, because here's the thing. When you're silent, you're showing agreement. And God gave you a mouth and a brain to speak up. He says, if you remain silent, if you do nothing, Esther... If you do nothing, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. He's saying God really wants to use you. God has a plan for you. God put you in this position for a reason. It's, it's not by accident. You're not fumbling through life. It is for a reason. He says, if, if God can't get you to step in Esther. And by the way, remember, God can move on from you like he moved on from Vashti, the king's wife, if you missed the last few weeks. He says, Esther, what God is going to do, God is going to do it. The only question is, will he be able to do it through you? He says, for a deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Who's my father's family? He's saying, Esther, me, bro. <laughs> I'm the only one left. If you don't do something, Esther, we're both going down. For who knows if you were brought into the palace for such a time as this. For such a time as this. What he's trying to get Esther to see is that all of your pain, all of your brokenness, all of what you didn't get as a little girl, and all that God has done to set the stage for you. He's saying, Esther, this right here is your moment. This is your moment to own. This is your moment to step into. This is your moment to see God use you, the girl that everybody gave up on, the girl that experienced so much loss. This is the moment for God to say, and this is why I made her king. This is the moment for people to say, and this is why God made you that. And this is why God made you this. And this is why God gave you money. And this is why God healed you. And this is why God didn't let you die. And this is why God kept you when everything was going wrong. And this is why you didn't commit suicide. And this is why you didn't overdose. It is the moment right 
here, Esther, he is saying, this is your time to grab the moment for somebody. God is saying, you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. It is your moment to own. It is your moment to grab. It is your moment to take. It is your moment to declare. And Esther, he's saying, if God can't get you to step into your purpose, it's all going to fall apart. Because Esther, what I'm giving you right now is your turn off notice. It took so much to get you here. But if you get comfortable, you're going to go back to where you came from. This is your turn off notice. And this may not be for everybody, but there's somebody here. Just, just hearing that word turn off makes you uncomfortable. But it's supposed to. Because it is God giving you a notice and not making a final decision. And if you're here, it's a notice. There is not one person listening that God has given the verdict of a final decision to. But he did send me to give you the notice. And Esther makes the statement. She, she shook that off. That comfortable hook that was in her mouth. She said, if I perish, I perish. And she stepped into the moment. And there's so much going on in her mind, what the king said. Whoever comes within my presence will die unless I give them favor. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. As I bring this home. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, For we have not a high priest that can not be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. I heard this sermon preached some years ago by a man named Bishop Sherman Watkins in Columbus, Ohio. And I was going to support my spiritual father. His spiritual mother had died. And I flew in to support him and be there for him. And uh, the Bishop Watkins preached this text right here at her funeral. And he said he just pictures us uh, being like Esther. Stepping into the presence of the king. Looking to find favor. Only to hear God say, not only do you get my favor, but well done. Esther is nervous. Esther is trembling. But this is where you know you're being used by God. It's that risky place. See, sometimes God needs to just shake us again. Sometimes God has to make us afraid again. It's not that he's torturing us. He just wants to put us in the realm of faith again. Where we can feel him. Where we can depend on him. Esther starts walking towards the king. And it says, when the king saw her. Understand this. The king always sees faith. And the king will never punish faith. Even if, like Peter, faith got you to get out of the boat, but fear caused you to sink. The king will always stretch forth his hand to grab somebody that takes a risk to trust him. The king sees her. And the king grants his, her his favor with his scepter. And it says that the king asked her a question. What can I do for you? 
She had all of these fears because she got comfortable. And the Bible says it like this. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear always creeps in when we get comfortable. Not realizing that all she had to do was step boldly to the throne to get all the grace, favor, and mercy she needed for the next battle she had to fight. And God is so bad in a good way. God is so bad that it says it, it went so well that, that, that remember the plan the enemy had to kill the Jews? Re, 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 remember the gallows that Haman, his wife, and his friends came up with? The, the enemy was forming a weapon. But, but the Bible makes it clear that no weapon that forms against us can prosper. The, the enemy was plotting. The enemy built the gallows. The, the enemy hung the rope. But it says that when it was all said and done, be, because Esther made a decision to walk by faith and not by sight, because Esther got her fire back, got her mojo back, and said, basically, for me to live is Christ. And to die is a gain. The, the very trap, the, the very weapon, the very tactic that the enemy came up with to hurt Esther, it says that Haman was hanged from the gallows that he built for Mordecai. I say all of that to say, as I drop the mic and get out of here, that every attack, every manipulation, every tactic, every sickness, every disease, every enemy, every hater, every blog that has gone out about you, God says, if I can get you to take a step and trust me, I am going to allow the enemy's trap to backfire. I am going to allow the enemy to be hung by what he's been trying to hang you by. Esther, all God is saying today is, I just need you to make a move. I just need you to take a step. I just need you to trust me. I just need you to walk by faith faith and not by sight. I need you to stop getting comfortable. I need you to start living by faith again. I need you to be courageous. I need you to remember where God brought you from and what God is trying to do. And that just because you've arrived, it doesn't mean that God does not need you for something else in this season. Say, make a move. Say, make a move. Now look at your neighbor and say, make a move. Because this is your turn off notice. And it comes down to this. How bad do you want to step into something bigger than you? It's just a notice. But notice has become permanent. When they're not taken serious. Somebody said, what made you come up with that title? I said, it's funny. Because I had gotten something not too long ago. And I had forgot to put it in the system to get paid. And I opened my mail and it said, turn off notice. And I said, oh, goodness. And it, it made my eyes start twitching. It took me all the way back to Glen Burnie. It took me all the way back to Brooklyn Homes. It like knocked me back to my past. And it, it got taken care of. But that's what the turn off notice was supposed to do. It was supposed to knock me back. And then the next day they sent me a text message with all caps. Your payment is past due. Please. I was like, whoa, we got to get this taken care of. And that's what God sent me here to do to somebody today or say to somebody today, we got to get this taken care of. 
I just delivered the letter. Only you know what's about to get turned off. And you're here today because something is driving you and something is pushing you. You're watching today because something is, is nagging you. Something has you scared. And that something is the turnoff notice. 